Hello, everybody. Welcome back. <clears throat> Welcome to the afternoon session of the second day of the Symposium on New Demonia and Music Learning. Uh, we've had a thoroughly thought-provoking morning, and it's lovely to be back here this afternoon. So it's a privilege and pleasure to welcome Ava Eagle, presenting on the topic of Philia and Police, an exploration of eudaimonia, friendship, and political community among underground club DJs. Ava, whenever you're ready to go. Share my screen. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending my uh, portion of the talk today. Uh, the ideas of eudaimonia, community, and friendship are used as a lens in the analysis of a portion of a case study of LGBTQ underground club DJs working in New York. As part of a larger ongoing project that began in 2012, this recent round of interviews was conducted in the aftermath of World Pride in 2019. In the wake of World Pride, which celebrated 50 years since Stonewall in New York, many conversations with DJs addressed community building and queer nightlife. Laban Wenger's work related to situating learning helped me think through the initial learning experiences among DJs. While this work was helpful, I felt as if I needed more tools to think through friendships and the sense of community that DJ participants described. I found their language concerning old timers and newcomers just inadequate to capture the multitude of interactions participants described during their learning experiences. As my orientation towards music making and learning tend to be of a practical nature, I began to look at Aristotle's consideration of eudaimonia, friendship, and community in an effort to describe in a more nuanced way interactions among DJs. While no means exhaustive or perfect, it became a point of entry for further consideration. Uh, Rabbis et al. explore eudaimonia and community in two parts, philia and police, and I'm going to organize my paper in the same way. Uh, all right, we should talk about friendship. Uh, while Aristotle argues that we need friends for the eudaimonic life, I want to explore how DJs engage in friendships. Since DJs in the study learned primarily through situated learning practices, friendships were essential. Unlike paying tuition, enrolling in classes, or pursuing a degree, DJs need their friends for learning, either during enculturation and initial learning experiences or throughout their development as professionals. DJs in the study uh, found friends to help them learn their craft and to develop as uh, professionals and to navigate the pleasures of nightlife. The pleasures of nightlife theme is one I'm not gonna touch on too much here. Um, but I did wanna talk about um, pleasure, utility, and virtue. Uh, Aristotle explains there are three types of friendship, those of utility, pleasure, and virtue. Uh, in a nightlife scenario, pleasure abounds, and those friendships abound too. Our purposes are not to discuss those here, but utility and virtue will be more of the focus. Um, in a situated learning environment, DJs learn from old timers or mentors. These more experienced DJs take time to help aspiring DJs during a, a phase of initial learning experiences. For many, this involves a lot of watching and hanging out in the DJ booth. There's a lot to be said on this topic. For the sake of brevity, I think it's best to per, um, proceed to what I consider the most important point. Friendships described among participant DJs are akin to the close bonds of parenting. And I'm thinking of it in terms of children and parents, because I did a, uh, quite a number of interviews with people and their mentors. So that was kind of a fun way to think about it. I'm reminded of the broader definition of philia. Drawing on Liddell and Cooper Helm reminds us philia originally meant a kind of affectionate regard or friendly feeling, not towards just one's friends, but also family members, business partners, and in a country at large. There were numerous times when DJ participants described their mentors and mentees with great affection and language that reflects a close association of family. Children, along with DJ daughter, and other language of a familial association were rampant in the transcripts. This language has been documented by other LGBTQ nightlife scholars and reflects the closeness of the LGBTQ chosen family. Um, for more uh, on this, see more in 2018. Um, one example of this is from uh, Will Automagic, uh, who is a DJ dad. Um, 
He says, there's several DJs who hang around that I love, that I'm proud to have had some influence on. I don't want to leave anyone out. There's a good five or six of them, but there's probably more. Nita said to me the other day, I didn't know you were so-and-so's DJ father. When he said that to me, I hadn't realized that I was either, but that person used to come and watch me DJ all the time and ask questions. And we use the word father and mother interchangeably when it comes to DJ mentoring. Yeah, I'm his mother, that's my daughter and so on. The gender term's just a free for all. When Will describes his DJ children as those whom I love and am proud to have had some influence on, he sounds as if he's brimming with parental pride. When Ernie describes his kids, especially Maddie, the DJ, he spent a lot of time helping, his affection is apparent. In the 2019 interview with Maddie, Maddie described Ernie in parental terms, owing his DJ career to him and shared his sentiments of indebtedness. These conversations reveal an instance in which Aristotle's words are appropriate. And honors paid to the gods or to parents, no one could ever return to them the equivalent of what he gets. So far, our conversation has been on the relationship between old timers and newcomers. This type of mentorship or friendship of utility has been our focus. We should turn our attention now to friendships of virtue. When I would ask DJs if they still received mentoring at later stages in their careers, they reported the nature of mentoring shifted. Sometimes they acknowledged that they then became mentors, but oftentimes uh, they tended to say they didn't receive mentoring anymore, but that they had close friends or peers in whom they found support. And these are the sort of virtue friendships we'll be, we'll be talking about, these sort of perfect friendships. Uh, one such close friendship is between playing partners, Will and Nita as the Carry Nation. Nita describes, I've been finding that peer support with Will, which is really great. I've also been finding that with peers that have been doing it just a little bit longer. We're all sort of coming up in this together and we're creating this portion of the story as a group. It's kind of amazing. I think we're probably being mentors to other people more than I have being mentored to me. Outside of the closeness with Will, Nita mentioned other peers. When asked about, uh, he, expl oh, he explained uh, that he found friendship among DJ peers in other cities, which was interesting to me. And that's the thing we've been creating is community of underground DJs. By all banding together and supporting each other, we've all been able to come up together. The fact that we're constantly traveling and touring, anytime you go anywhere, there's always a group of your sisters in town, a bunch of DJ homies, and we're all just playing, having a wonderful time. The idea of an international community of underground DJs is an interesting one to me. This is a theme that emerged as individual DJs increasingly experience success in their own local undergrounds. They are invited to travel and perform in clubs and festivals. And in doing so, they of course meet other DJs that have been successful in their own local undergrounds. I coded these comments as underground rising in my analysis. Um, it increasingly made sense when considering a peer relationship. For Aristotle, those are alike in virtue or statue. And there are a limited number of DJs in each city that have achieved this. And it makes sense that they would look outside of their own city to have that kind of a peer relationship and a kind of a community. Um, Lena, another DJ, echoes a similar sentiment. Um, she names, a, I asked her, who are, who are your peers uh, that, you, that you are in contact with? And what's your relationship like? And she named a bunch of them and they all lived in other cities or in some were in New Yorkers too. And she says, when I tell you we are family, our family, I love that. There is this unspoken bond between of DJ, us DJs of that time who are spinning, who are successful and who are out there schooling the kids. It's pretty special. You need anything, you can always holler at them. The unspoken bond between of us DJs at that time imbues a certain professional respect, well wishes and camaraderie in the chosen profession. When I asked Nita about how he lasted in nightlife for so long, he highlighted the help of his friends. And he said, constant check-ins, getting sober every once in a while has really been key to that big time. Recognizing when you're going a little too hard and taking control of yourself. And looking out for each other is important. I'm really lucky to be doing this with somebody, to be on a journey with a partner. I can't imagine all of this touring and stuff solo. I do have friends of mine that do that. But then we're all in contact with, you, with each other all the time. We have to take care of each other and we do. I think more and more these days we talk about mental health shit. When you just look out there and you see what you don't want it to be, there's a planets of examples of how not to do this. 
If we had more time, it would be appropriate to have a fuller discussion about the ways in which the friends have helped each other navigate the party uh, component of nightlife. That was a big theme that they kept bringing up and how they helped each other. Um, however, I would like to move on to the idea of community in uh, LGBT nightlife. So we're gonna talk a bit about polis or uh, political community. Um, there are individuals roles in nightlife community akin to the sailing example uh, that Aristotle mentions. Um, DJs, promoters, hosts, nightlife personalities, and so on constitute this community. Aristotle opens book three of politics this way to probe a relationship between the good citizen, the good man, and continues to describe the relationship among types of government. However, that's not my focus here. Uh, while Aristotle's considering more of the political state, city state, or political community, I'm pro probing a more general idea without a focus on political science per se. Um, in some way, for that reason, politics is maybe not the best fit for exploring this sense community, but well, I'm gonna go for it anyway. Um, what catches my attention with this quote is the idea of salvation of the community, or as another translation reads, their business is the security of their community. On a most basic level, the sailors in the nightlife participants want similar things. So the sailors are trying to navigate, but um, that's their aim. But my question is, what constitutes salvation of the community or security of the community in LGBTQ nightlife? Um, prior to exploring these questions too much, I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about some of the micro communities um, and alliances and affiliations. Um, there are these affiliations of friendships that make up what are akin to micro communities that exist within the larger context of LGBTQ nightlife in New York. Examples that participants mention are promoter production companies, um, DIY party affiliations, and uh, houses. So we're gonna, I'm gonna just talk through them kind of quickly because those are uh, the more interesting part. So these promoter production affiliations, um, the first one here is uh, anti-twink. This is uh, what Ernie Cody describes his is Antichrist Twink uh, Collective. And he has what he describes as essentially a family of kids that work and he helps them nurture their careers and come up through it. Um, and over in, I've talked to several people in this collective that have spoken so fondly about the sharing and the nature and the love that they have for each other as they organize to do these parties. So the, these are sort of more formal structures, either working with a promoter or these production alliances. Another one, uh, this one here, this is Frankie Sharp. He's um, a big promoter in New York. Uh, he, we had an interview and he's, he's a lot of fun to listen to. They, they both are, but it's a similar idea of this community and this love and it's this uh, structured organization for throwing events and for parties. There's also sort of a less structured one, which are these DIY affiliations. So sometimes younger DJs, when they're trying to find work, they'll band together and now there's more legal warehouses where they can do this, but they'll get together and they'll throw parties. So that's a less structured sort of orientation. And then um, one of the fun ones I think to talk about are houses. Um, and Ernie expl explains um, houses this way. It's, I think very Paris is burning for a moment. Uh, there are all of these houses like Aviance, Extravaganza, and so on, and all these houses of these kids that are largely street kids that don't have anywhere to go. And there's a mother of the house and she kind of takes care of them all, but they end up walking in these competitions or balls and part of the competition is voguing. Um, I should be clear in separating ball culture from nightlife culture per se, like there's some overlap, but they're not necessarily the same thing. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of the houses. Uh, Kevin Graves recognizes the sense of community among house members and he says it's super important in nightlife. Unfortunately, black and Latin gay kids, even in New York, still have a hard time. They need that community. Unfortunately, this is one of the reasons why I'm going back to school to study psychology and become eventually maybe a therapist or work with LGBT people. Uh, it's that there's a lot of kids that get kicked out of their families and there's religion issues that happen with people. It's funny, I know some community, in the community, some gay men of color will look down on his houses as old school, not necessary, but it's not true, they're essential. Um, only one of the participants that I interviewed is actually in a house, um, and that's Nita Aviance. And Aviance is the his surname that he takes professionally that is his, the name of his house. So a lot of people do that, they'll use their, their sort of, their 
professional name is their surname for the house. Um, so I asked them, how has being Aviance helped you over the years? What's your relationship like to the house? And he says, it's been interesting to be sort of an established artist within the house as Kevin, Kevin Aviance, another really important performer, has made his journey with recovery and has come back into the scene. It's been really incredible to be connected with all of that. We are always pushing forward and supporting each other in all of our weird musical fantasies. So I think that sisterhood has been an amazing support. Kevin just had his quote unquote DJ debut last weekend at the Birdcage. And that was amazing to be able to do that with him. And he said to me, I don't want you to feel like I'm stepping on your toes. And I was like, how can I ever feel that way? You gave me so many opportunities 20 years ago when I first came up to explore all my shit. So for me to be able to give back to him is really important. So this, the house is there, we've got little screen grabs of extravaganza and audience. Um, we're gonna talk a moment about well-being of community. A theme uh, among participants is that they intensely valued LGBT nightlife community in New York and recognized the need to work with other scene participants to ensure the well-being of the local nightlife community, akin to the sailors in Aristotle's example. People, uh, Lena, and had some fun thoughts about this. I'll just read a few quotes. She says, people who are down with soulful house music, we are community, we are love, and we are longevity. It is unlike any other community I've ever seen, a sense of community and love there and respect. Will Automagic said this to me, and I thought this is great. I always ask people closing thoughts, and he says, as a closer, my thought is no matter what happens with a person's DJ career that you care about, if you're a DJ, things work best when we help each other out. There's always gonna be a little bit of competition. That competition can be healthy, can create magic when it's bridled to a means of working together to make yourself better. Fun competition always makes you better. For the magic of nightlife in our city, things work best and most smoothly when we put aside jealousy and competition and work together to make magic. So this is not to imply that the community is perfect, right? So we'll talk about that a moment. While participants echoed the ideas of well, wishing well-being for their local nightlife community, there was an acknowledgement that it's not unified and it is imperfect. And I also want to be careful not to paint a picture of LGBT community with one stroke. I'm really just kind of talking about this instance in nightlife very specifically here. Uh, with that acknowledgement, many participants echoed a need to help the next generation build nightlife community. They thought that that was very important. So there's this kind of intergenerational sentiment I, I kind of coded as school to children. Um, Aristotle devotes a large amount of politics to this discussion of education. He recognizes the need to develop another generation, an effort to create good citizens that contribute to the political state. In a similar way, participant DJs echoed the importance of schooling the children. Many of the DJs reported becoming mentors to an upcoming generation and were aware of the importance of doing this. Many echoed the argument that New York nightlife grew out of Stonewall 50 years earlier and these fights for LGBTQ rights along with the struggle in creating safe spaces for leisure, uh, such as nightclubs were important. Uh, as such, intergenerational sentiment to school the children was prevalent among participants. Lena reflects on this and she says, the beautiful legendary children that helped mold me as a child live within me. But I think that when you get to a particular maturity place in your life, you don't look to others, you inspire within yourself. Therefore, other people are going to look to you as you did to your predecessors before you. How is it feeling? Therefore, that feeling has got to live in through you. As long as the music's being played and produced, good music, darling, it is our responsibility to show these children what it's about. The more each of us individuals come in contact with, it builds a huge village. For me, I'm here to school the children. In a similar way, Nita describes the importance of helping a new generation as he expounds upon the development of queer spaces. And this part I thought was actually one of the more interesting moments um, in conversation. And he's talking about uh, queer festivals that are kind of a recent development. And he says, that's the amazing thing about the whole festival or Hancho Campout, these crews that are really doing the brunt work within their own cities. Then they come to a bigger platform with everybody than to get to take their own story to the global stage which is really cool. 
It's interesting that you're, and I say to him, it's interesting your career has grown and you're connecting to folks in other cities. And he says, yeah, it's pretty brilliant. It's so cool. We're all kind of in middle age. Everyone's hovering around the early forties. We're presenting all this stuff for a generation of young of people younger than us. We're sitting there looking at all these kids, all these queer kids having the time of their lives, just dancing in the middle of the woods. And I was like, wow, what an incredible thing. I wish there was something like that when I was 20 years old, to go out with all my friends and just freak out in a totally queer space, to be totally free and have all this new music and sounds. And I say, well, we're the same vintage. I don't remember queer spaces like that. Not that I necessarily would have been in tune with it, but what's changed since we were kids? And he says, there wasn't, there wasn't places like that. There were just clubs he went to and it wasn't entirely queer owned and operated. That's something that's really changed a lot. It's very cool to see over the last 10 years how, how that things have developed because we had to make the space for ourselves. We wanted it to be a particular way and no one was going to give it to us. Part of that becomes proving in New York a lot. Part of that becomes proving your worth so you can get access to venues and spaces to use or creating it or finding it yourself with some of the DIY things we've been doing with legalized venues. This intergenerational sentiment towards schooling the children includes ideas of creating safe spaces, as Nita suggests, and other mentoring exchanges, such as helping a younger generation navigate the business end of nightlife work and learning to DJ. I want to talk a little bit about concentric circles and leave with some closing remarks. How am I doing on time, Gareth? Are you doing great? Yeah, you've got five minutes. Oh, score. Okay, great. All right, so I kind of made a funny diagram. So we got nightlife <laughs> and we got LGBTQ community and then we have the intersection, right? And then we have all these kind of micro communities that I was talking about, the DIY affiliations, the promoting production companies and affiliations, and then the houses. And what I think is important uh, so far, We've, the conversation's been on the well being of local nightlife. Um, however, in the wake of Royal Pride and in the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, many DJs mentioned the well being of LGBTQ community and the efforts they took to promote the community's, the larger community's well being. And I think it's worth considering how these ideas overlap. So, a lot of them think of nightlife community. LGBTQ nightlife community and they advocate how to promote it as we, we just discussed. And then they also talk about, a lot of them talk about the LGBT community in a larger sense, not specifically nightlife. Um, and they make efforts to serve that community as well. So that's people exist in these different areas and they serve other areas too. So I kind of wanted to highlight some of the ways, some of the work that the DJs do for the larger community. Um, uh, one of them was Lena and she um, works with the embassy in Hanoi to uh, develop and give talks to LGBTQ youth. And she was working on developing a community center um, in Hanoi for LGBTQ youth and for women that were sex trafficked. So, so she spent a lot of time going there and she's been in talks with that. Um, Ernie, uh, one of the dads, is uh, in the time I knew him, he became a licensed therapist and he spends his time, treat, um, he has practices for uh, LGBTQ community in mental health as a mental health professional. Um, and he was telling me how his relationship with Lena has been important as he talks he's been able to have someone to talk to about transitioning and some of those implications. So they have that nightlife overlap, but he's using it in the context to help another, the larger community. And the last one um, I wanna highlight is uh, Kevin Graves. Uh, Kevin was the person who said, um, I've been thinking about going back and getting a degree in psychology to help LGBTQ people. The time I first met him in 2012, he had, uh, he didn't, he hadn't gone to college. He had dropped out and he was in New York. He was DJing full time. When I saw, caught up with him in about 2014, he had started an undergraduate degree at Columbia and he was telling me he wanted to do this in psychology. And then uh, 2019, he, or no, a few years ago, he moved out to LA to get a master's and he just finished and he's a, he's a mental health professional now. So there's kind of like this idea of 
contributing it in the larger sense. Um, so thank you.